Now that he'd fallen from grace, now that he was rebellious against God, now the Lord says, if he eats from that tree, he'll live forever physically. Right. He'll live forever physically. The tree of life will keep him alive physically. He already died spiritually. So, can you put the other one up with, the, with those two uh, seraphim? God put the seraphim with those big, powerful angels. God put them in the garden. Let's see. Verse, verse 23 of chapter 3. Therefore the Lord God set, sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. He did that so Adam couldn't go back into the garden and eat of the tree of life. And live forever physically in that, in that uh, fallen, spiritually dead state. Coming back to chapter 3, verse 9, And the Lord God called to Adam and said, because he ate, Where are you? Because in verse 8, they, Adam and Eve found out that they were naked. So they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Verse 10, Adam says in verse 10, so he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I know the sound of that voice. I've, I've, I know that voice. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman did it. The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree. And I ate. Well, you talk about passing the buck. And man been doing that ever since. Yes. Well, it's not my fault. She did it. Can you imagine her face? Yeah. If I had a million, I'd give a million just to watch her face. <laughs> yep, Lord, she did it. <laughs> Interesting, huh? She did it. And the Lord said to the woman in verse 13, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. She went, Oh, the snake did it. The serpent. So they all passed the buck. And Adam said, Verse 23, No, verse 14, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. Notice he's not talking to a spiritual being. Here he's talking to an animal. Because he compared it to cattle, beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust, snakes crawl around all the days of your life. And then in verse 15, now he begins, now he, he's, he's going to speak in reference to Satan himself. And I will put enmity, hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. The snake seed is lost man. The woman seed eventually will be the people of God. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Talking about the cross, the crucifixion. Jesus defeated Satan at the cross. We have some modern day preachers that say that Jesus was a failure. They say he lost at the cross. He blew it at the cross. He didn't succeed. He failed at the cross. He didn't fall. I mean, he didn't from grace. He didn't fail. He didn't blow. That's what he came to do, to die at the cross. That's right. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So Satan bruised his head. Satan bruised his heel, rather. But Jesus destroyed Satan when he bruised his head. So, so we could see a double meaning in the prophecy that first he talked to the snake, the animal, because it was used to deceive the human race at the time, two people, and then to address what was going to happen. God already had the plan of salvation in mind before any of this happened. God knows the future, but he put it into motion and let it work. Or let it work itself through. So, we see God created 
man to have fellowship with him. And then the fellowship was broken. And the devil said, I got him now. Uh, I know God's up to something because Satan, being a genius, he knows God just doesn't do something without a plan, a master plan. And he said, I broke the master plan. And Satan's been trying to break that master plan ever since. And if you read the book of Revelation, he continues to do so. He just doesn't get it. He said his, his efforts just don't stop. He's good at his job. He's good at evil. He's the master. Jesus said he's the father of lies. So we saw fellowship with God. We saw fellowship broken. So now what's going to happen? Though Adam's sin broke the fellowship between God and man, Jesus' sacrifice at Calvary's cross restored that yes. fellowship. Amen. If we go put that, that last one up, uh, Susan, please. Notice, we could have picked a lot of different things that said, uh, come to Jesus, receive Him as Savior, receive Him as Lord, but they, the modern church leaves out that one word at the beginning, repent. So people just, they go to certain churches and they tell them, just come to Jesus, just believe in Jesus. Doesn't tell them to repent. And you have to repent. You have to acknowledge that you're in sin and that you're on your way to a hell and God not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want that. So God provided a way <clears throat> through the cross, through Jesus Christ, Receiving him, believing that he is the Son of God, that you're a sinner, he took your sin, and on the cross paid the debt of your sin by giving up his life. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But first, you've got to repent. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the people, when they, all these things were going on, then Peter came out to preach, and the people said, they were convicted in their heart. They realized the people, the Bible says 3,000 men, so with the women, it had to be more. It's, they were convicted. Oh, my God, we're in sin. And I'll add this again. What does convicted mean? Have you ever been in a court of law? Have you ever been a juror? I have been a juror several times over there. I don't like it, but they've given me no choice whatsoever. And when... The jury comes out after they've been the deliberating and the chairman of the jury uh, passes the note to the judge and the judge read it and the judge says, the jury has declared you guilty. Okay, so you've been convicted of whatever crime that this case was about. You've been convicted as a sinner, not a sinner, a lawbreaker. I was on a case where it was murder. You've been convicted of the crime. And now the judge has to pass judgment, which they usually do another day. Uh, according to the law, depending on what the crime is, how it happened, different kinds of murder, first degree, second, so on. So you have to be convicted by the Holy Spirit when you hear the gospel that you're guilty. You've been found wanting. You've been found guilty. Because every human being was born with the sin. We've been born with sin. Sin came into the world. But God made a way out. And it's the cross of Jesus. That's what he came for. He came to die, to go to a cross, to pay the price for our sin. But like Peter told the people when they were those thousands, what shall we do? And the first word that came out of Peter's mouth in answering that was repent. Repent. You know what repent means? That means turn your back on what you were doing and go the other way. Turn your back on a godless life. Face Jesus and walk with Him. Receive Him as your Savior and Lord. Yes. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Without repentance, there can't be salvation. Because you have to, the Holy Spirit lets you know, like those thousands of people that Peter was preaching to, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they realized, my God, we're lost. How does that happen? Man can't do that. 
God, the Holy Spirit, came on the scene and convicted them in their heart. They knew. They realized we're lost. That's what the Holy Spirit does when the gospel is preached. Amen. If the gospel is not preached, the Holy Spirit has nothing to, go, to convict the person about. So they just leave people in some kind of prayer or whatever, but nothing happens. So that's the way God made. <laughs> oh, God made a way out. God knew that before he ever created the man. Because God knows the future. He knows the end from the beginning. But he put it all into motion. All into motion. So, man is no longer able to walk and have fellowship with God in the cool of the day as Adam did. But we can fellowship with God through prayer. Now that we're saved, God's not going to call you out to a garden somewhere and appear the way he appeared to Adam and Eve and talk to you. So I'm saved. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Heaven's my home. I have the assurance of salvation. Isn't that wonderful? But I, oh, if only I could talk with the Lord in the cool of the day, face to face. Wow. That's not going to happen until the Lord takes us home. Hallelujah. Until the rapture of the church. That's not going to happen. But something can happen in which we can have fellowship with God through prayer. Amen. Through prayer. Amen. God is waiting for you to pray. What is prayer? Talking to God. Yes, sir. Talking communion with God. Talking. Amen. Have you ever had fellowship with a person without talking? No, you got to talk. Every, everybody I know that I've gotten going, we talk. They find out about me, I find out about them, and, and, and we talk. And that's fellowship. God's waiting for us to talk to, to us. And He made a way when we receive God the Father through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we've been adopted into the family of God. Now He wants to talk to us. So he says, pray. And a lot of Christians, I want to say most, but I don't know enough to say that. So many Christians don't talk to God. And they're saved. I'm talking about people that have the fruit of salvation in their life, according to the Bible. But they don't talk to God. Only in emergency situations. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, help me. And God's so good, he oftentimes will. Sometimes he won't. Sometimes he lets you back up against the wall, then maybe then you'll cry out to him and begin to talk with him. So God waits for us. Back in the garden when man had sinned, the Lord's walking in the cool of the day in the garden. Adam! Adam, they heard his voice. He was, well, Adam, where are you? Adam, it doesn't say anything about Eve, but I'm sure he was saying, Adam, where are you? Eve, where are you? He's looking for them. He's still looking today for us. He's calling your name. He's calling my name. Sam, where are you? Yeah. Why does God want to talk to me? Because that's why He created us. Yeah. That's why He created me. Yeah. To have fellowship with Him, not to serve Him. Or if I give my life to Jesus, He's going to make me go to the Philippines. He's going to make me go to China. He's going to make me to go to, to Russia. He's gonna... That's not why He created you. If you serve Him, yeah, you'll gladly go where He sends you. But he wants fellowship with you. And he wants you to use you to bring others so he can have fellowship with them. Right. That's it. So if he's called you to do something, you're blessed yeah. to have a part in, the, in, the, in, in bringing more people to Jesus. But why did he create us? To have fellowship. He wants you to talk to him. Well, I don't know what to say to him. You should have a lot of people. You should have a lot to say with your friends on that phone when you get on that conversation and you're there for an hour. Come on, talk to God. He's your Father. Amen. Jesus said in that day, the day after He would be crucified and resurrect, He said, "In that day, believers, you won't ask me anything. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, He'll give it to you." So we're directed to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. Amen. We can pray to Jesus. That's okay. But the instruction was, pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. 
The father holds the executive branch. The father has adopted you into the family of God. You're in God's family. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, John 14, that where I am, there you may be also. So all this time, he's been preparing a place for us where he lives in heaven. There's a place for you if you're born again. It's waiting for you. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's what we have to look forward to. And he gives us the assurance of salvation. It's not, gee, I hope I make it. I hope if I do enough good things, it's not about good things. Heaven is not for good people. Heaven is for saved people. Heaven is for forgiven people. Heaven is for people that were guilty but just said, Lord, forgive me. I'm guilty. Forgive me. And he instantly forgives you because the price was already paid at the cross. Hallelujah. So I can go, I can pray. Oh, and if I fall, it's like a child. It falls and gets up again. We just get up again. Father, forgive me, and walk on with the Lord. The Lord knows that we're just made out of dust and dirt. But our hearts.